All right, well, here we are again, uh, our series In Love for Life, Building or Rebuilding a Great Marriage. This is lesson number six, The Money Trap, The Money Trap. I hope everybody's got their uh, worksheets uh, uh, to follow along. Well, uh, as the title suggests, uh, I want to talk about money, a very important issue uh, in marriage. You know, people have different attitudes about money when they come into a marriage. And a lot of times the collision of two ideas about money within a marriage uh, creates a lot of stress. Um, some researchers uh, have found that uh, money issues and especially how money is handled is responsible for uh, up to 70% of marital conflicts. Now there are a lot of reasons for that, uh, for this type of conflict over money. One, uh, people have different ideas and different training about money and they bring those into their relationship. For example, you know, she may come from a family where money uh, was tight, where you budgeted carefully, you know, money was for saving, for planning, uh, so on and so forth. You know, she comes from that background, she has that ideology. And he, you know, the, the husband, he comes from a family where you know, they didn't worry about money. You know, we live from day to day, money's for spending, you know, tomorrow, manana, no problem. Well, when you take these two people and their ideas about money and you put them in a relationship and they have to begin dealing with their pooled resources, you know, many times it causes a problem. Another uh, reason that there are um, money issues or money conflicts in a marriage uh, is because there's no discussion about money before marriage and so many times it comes as a nasty surprise. Oh, I didn't know you were like this or I didn't know you were like that. You know, we don't talk about money, we have no idea about how our partner uh, uses money or thinks about money and uh, when you're in the marriage and you have to actually deal with real money and real budgets, um, that also can be a, uh, an issue of conflict. And then of course different economic Back, uh, backgrounds. Not just how we think about money, but you know, he comes from perhaps a poor lower middle class home, uh, or, or not a, a poor lower middle class, but he may come from a poor home. She may come from a, a home where her uh, father was a professional, a doctor, a lawyer, something like that. They had um, uh, more uh, money to spend, better college education, so on and so forth. So you know, when you have people coming from different socioeconomic uh, classes and they marry, then there is also the potential for conflict in marriage. So the conflict in a relationship over money usually centers around two main factors and that is earning power, in other words the ability to make money, and lifestyle and that is the style of living that we think or that we hope or that we believe that we should have. And so the idea or the conflict is the way we use or misuse money is based largely on these two factors, earning power and lifestyle. And it works something like this. If our earning power can supply our lifestyle, there's no problem. You usually can work it out. I mean, if there's enough money to go around to buy and save and budget and, you know, and even do a little bit of crazy shopping and so on and so forth, there's no problem. However, if our earning power cannot supply our lifestyle, then this will create problems that will produce pressure within all of our relationships, especially within, um, within marriage. You know, uh, there's not enough money to go around. There's not enough money for the vacation and the savings. You know, how are we going to handle that? So this financial pressure, or this type of financial pressure is the result of what I call the money trap. That's why we call this lesson the money trap. So here's the money trap. Here's how it works uh, in a normal couple's life. Now, before we have any earning power, when I talk about earning power, I mean before we have some sort of training as far as a trade is concerned or a vocation or business or experience or training or education, you know, before we have, that's where your earning power is, right? 
It's based on your training, based on your education. Well, before any of that is actually you know, uh, gained in the individual, acquired by the individual, our concepts of lifestyle are actually already being formed. In other words, our concept of how we should live is being formed by two different forces, external forces and internal forces. Okay? So let me talk about the external forces, the external forces that are shaping what we think about money long before we actually have the ability to make money. So one of the external forces that shape our thinking about money is how our parents lived and their attitude towards money. In other words, what we were taught about money growing up. That's one of the external, uh, one of the external pressures or forces that shapes our thinking about money. Another one is uh, the phenomenon of easy credit. I know that in this financial climate, you know, we talk about credit being a little tighter, you know, but we live in an era where credit is, is really pretty easy to get. It's one of the most powerful external forces today when it comes to finance. Uh, didn't exist uh, roughly 100 years ago. I mean, uh, credit existed 100 years ago, but the ease of credit did not exist 100 years ago. 100 years ago, an 18-year-old just couldn't go in and buy clothes and, and shoes and all kinds of th things and just sign for it and walk out. You, you couldn't do that 100 years ago. The idea of exchanging future work for goods now on a consumer level was not as widespread 100 years ago as it is today. Today, I mean, you know, we're almost a cashless society, right? Debit cards, credit cards. We exchange work that we'll do in the future for goods that we will receive now. And that's an external force that, for, that forms our, our ideas about money and finance. And then the other external um, force or pressure is the abundance and the variety of merchandisers and merchandise. I mean, in other words, there's so much stuff to look at and buy. Again, something that did not exist a hundred years ago. You, know, you had a catalog, you had the Sears catalog that, that was mailed out, you know, and that was, wow, that was a lot to look at today. I mean, have you gone to shopping malls? Have you gone to stores? I mean, there are stores upon stores upon stores that sell all kinds of merchandise, you know, 50 different types of one thing. So we have a lot to choose from and a lot to purchase. All right, so those are some of the external forces that form our ideas about money. Early experiences and training, easy credit, and the abundance and accessibility to merchandise in our day and age. There are also some internal forces that uh, form or shape our thinking about money. Uh, many of them are negative. I'll only talk about the negative ones because these are the ones that you know, get us into trouble. Now, there are key advertising approaches that kind of you know, push our buttons, our internal buttons, to get us to buy, to get us to commit, to get us to engage financially. And I want to share some of these with you. For example, you know, we talk about greed. Greed is really the idea of never having enough. That's a certain button in us. That's a certain hot button, the greed button. And marketers, you know, when they say, hey, look, we have something new, something you know, a whole lot better, the new and improved, whatever it is, you know, that appeals to that thing inside of us that wants more. We never have quite enough. We want the newest thing. Uh, another internal force, another button that gets pushed is jealousy, for example. Uh, jealousy is wanting what others have. So how do you think marketers push that button, which motivates us to engage financially? Well, they say, you know what? You too can have. They have this, but you too can have. As a matter of fact, you ought to have this thing. Uh, the button of pride, you know, competing with others. Car companies are great with this. You can have the best, the very best. You deserve the very best. And if you purchase this thing, you will be known as an individual who has the very best. Not like these other cars, this car, this particular model, 
This is the best. It says something about you, that you are better than other people. It's, it's, it's amazing how that button gets pushed through various advertising. Laziness, for example, the, our, our lazy button, you know, it's getting something without you know, any effort. It's, it's, the, it's the basis of gambling. You know? It's with little effort, you know, we think we're going to win an inordinate amount of, of, of money or goods. Well, you know, marketing you know, pushes that lazy button when it tells us it's easy. It's easy, just come on in. I heard a commercial the other day that said, you know, this is how easy it is to get a brand new you know, $40,000 truck. We'll pay off your old car. We'll pay off your credit card debts. We'll do this, we'll do, this. it's easy. You just sign, uh, you just sign and walk away. No down, no down payment. We'll make it easy, no work involved, no commitment. Um, the lack of self-control button which a lot of us have. You know, the impulse, impulse buying, luxury buying. Usually the impulse button is pushed when marketers are saying, you got to do this now. I mean, it's probably one of the oldest you know, sales gimmicks. You got to do it now. Uh, I'm showing you the sale that we have and this car or this thing is available and it's only today because if you don't get it today, you'll never have this ever again. You know, you've just got to decide right now. And all that's doing is you know, pushing our impulse button. And then of course the selfishness button, the interest in our own needs, in our own self. You know? Usually the approach there is you know, uh, be the first. This is an exclusive offer. No one can have it. This is a limited edition and if you get this thing, you are going to be among the very few in the whole world that will have this particular thing. We don't understand many times that that commercial is playing you know, for a couple of million people at the same time. Nevertheless, it makes us feel that we're the only ones that will have this thing. And then, of course, uh, the trap. This is how the, the trap is, is sprung. Um, our society bombards us with media images of the ideal lifestyle that usually contains all these things that we should, that we should have and possess. It creates for us the style it says that we deserve or we should have. And if not properly trained in money management and common sense, we believe it. We believe what they're saying. We buy it. I don't just mean we buy the thing. We buy the, the dream. We buy the image that they're saying. Now the code words used appeal to our inward forces by saying you deserve the best and you should get it now and it's easy, and you'll be the first, and you'll be the only, and so on, and so on, and so on, day after day after day. I mean, you can't go anywhere where you're not bombarded with merchandising images. Why do you think there's so many car commercials on radio on Labor Day? Because we're off from work. We're not listening to the radio usually when we're at work, but we're on a day off. You know, I don't know about you, but you're in the garage, you're out in the yard, you got the radio on, you're, you're listening to all, and they're just bombarding you with ads. After the 10,000th ad about you know, how easy and you should, eventually they start you know, breaking you down. And then goods are made accessible everywhere to provide this ideal lifestyle and to make it easy to respond. All you have to do is pick up, pick up the phone. So you have the images of the ideal lifestyle and all the reasons why you should have it. And then accessibility, it's, it's easy. You go in and you just look online, you pick out the furniture you want, they'll deliver it to your house, no down payment, no payments till next year. How easy could this be? How accessible is all this material? Just hit the button. And then, of course, as I mentioned, easy credit. Easy credit makes all of these things available to everyone, even those who can't afford it. And those are the ones usually who are caught in the trap. You know, one of the big problems uh, here in the United States uh, in the last couple of years, you know, the housing bubble, the housing crash. I mean, it's very simple. People bought houses that they just couldn't afford. They, they buy three, four hundred thousand dollar houses when they had like thirty five thousand dollar salary. There's no way that they could afford it. Well, they could just barely afford it. But if something happened, 
You know, if they needed money for something else, a medical bill or you know, car breakdown, the, mi the minute that fine balance was broken, they had no reserve. They, you know, they'd, lose their, they'd lose their houses. And so the, these forces begin to work together and they create this vicious cycle. We see, we want, and easy credit uh, enables us to, to get it. And so the slogan for our society should be get it with credit, get it with credit. Now, I want you to understand I'm not against, you know, this is not, I'm not railing against our you know, capitalistic system and so on, merchandise. I'm not railing against that. I'm not against a strong economy, an efficient network of merchandising and distribution, and even a banking system that allows us to use credit wisely as a tool for establishing our homes and our businesses. I mean, uh, hallmarks of good stewardship, uh, or these are hallmarks of good stewardship in a well-run society. So I'm not against those things. The point I'm trying to make here is that in order to avoid being crushed in this system of ours, we should realize that our lifestyle should be based on our earning power, not how much our parents earned or how our parents lived, or not based on how we would like to live, and not based on what television says we should live or how we should live, not based on how our friends live, but based on our earnings. And that is a very sobering thought indeed. A lot of young couples today they look at their parents and they see, well, my, you know, my parents have a you know, 3,000 square foot house and they've got a yard and they've got a pool and they've got two cars and they, you know, they've got a condo in Florida. So, you know, they're looking at that and they think, well, well, when I'm 29 years old, this is what I should have too because my parents have it, I should have it. And they don't realize many times that their parents may have worked for 30 years in order to accumulate this type of, of wealth. And so they use credit unwisely to establish a lifestyle like they think they ought to have or should have or deserve. And that lifestyle is not based on reality, the reality of their earning power. So society combined with internal and external forces creates the image of a lifestyle we think we should have we believe this ideal, and instead of basing our lifestyle on our own earning power, we use easy credit to obtain the lifestyle we think we should have. So we get into all kinds of debt, and debt causes pressure in our relationship. And that's the point I'm trying to make. And I, I want to concentrate less on the economics of it and concentrate a little bit more now from here on in on the pressure that is exerted on the relationship because of finances. Now, financial pressure has many symptoms <clears throat> in a relationship. Fatigue, for example. Physical and emotional fatigue. You know, the weight of debt causes depression in people. I mean, indebtedness is a weight. If you don't believe me, uh, try, try remembering how it felt when you paid off your car or you paid off your house, or you paid off your student loan. How did you feel the day when you got that notice in the mail? Thank you very much, your house is paid off, your car is paid off, here's the lien release from the bank. You now own your, your car. Don't you feel, oh, you know, kind of a burden's been lifted off of you? Well, if you feel a burden's been lifted off of you when you pay off a legitimate debt, can you imagine how much too much debt weighs? You know, if, if there's a feeling of relief when it's gone, it must mean that there was a feeling of pressure when it was there. So fatigue, emotional fatigue is one of the symptoms of financial pressure. Obsession, we think and we talk only about money and money problems. A lot of the couples report that their discussions are always about money. If they're planning something you know, to, to do with the children, uh, instead of just you know, making the plan, will it be good for the kids, and so on and so forth, it becomes, can we afford this? Well, we're going to have to be able to pay that off before we can do this, and so on and so forth. 
And so we become obsessed. The debates and the arguments are always about, about money. And of course, uh, arguments start because we need to find the blame. Who's responsible for the financial mess that we're in? And a lot of times the blame is, you, know, you spend too much or, or the, you know, the reverse of that. You don't make enough. Or you know, maybe if you got another job or maybe if you tried harder at work. And so there are arguments about uh, who is responsible for the, the difficulty. Also, sexual disinterest. Let's face it, it's very hard to be intimate with someone that you've lost respect for. You know, if you don't respect somebody, it's very hard to feel very close to them. And usually sexual intimacy requires that you actually feel close to that individual. Financial ruin. I mean, eventually you have no more credit, just debts and debts that you can't, uh, that you can't pay. And financial ruin many times leads to family ruin. And then of course, there is spiritual discouragement, especially for those who are believers. You know, the feeling that God doesn't love you or He's punishing you because of your, your financial ruin. Now, pressure of this kind, as I mentioned, can easily destroy a relationship. So that's why we're talking in this uh, In Love for Life series. Uh, that's why we're talking about money, because Money problems have a tremendous effect on the quality of one's relationship in marriage. Now, there are a lot of financial advisors and plans, but you need to be careful not to make matters worse. Not all financial solutions are equal. And I've seen a lot of people, you know, they get into financial trouble, and instead of you know, fixing it or doing the things they need to do to make it better, they actually, they actually make it worse. So here are some bad solutions, okay? Let me preface this part by saying bad solution. These are bad solutions uh, to money problems and I'll show you bad solutions uh, through the images of animals, okay? You'll, you'll get what I'm trying to do here in a minute. So one of the bad solutions is what I call the ostrich solution. The ostrich solution is the following. Just refuse to admit that there is a problem. If you ignore the problem, you know, it'll, it'll just go away. You know, let's not even talk about money. Let's you know, forget about that. We don't, you know, we don't talk about that type of thing. It reminds me of a, a cousin of mine long ago when I was a young guy. Uh, he, uh, he bought a car, he bought a brand new Camaro, a yellow Camaro, canary yellow, I remember. We were all jealous of him because he had this nice new car. And um, his name was Angelo and he, he would drive around and so on and so forth. But Angelo was a very carefree individual. So if he wanted to go to the movies, uh, he'd go downtown to the movies. Oh, there was a parking spot in front of the theater. He just parked the car there and just walk into the theater, you know, whatever. And then he'd come out and there'd be a ticket on his, because he never looked at no parking, none, none of that, you know, handicap zone, nothing. He just parked it wherever he felt like it. And so he'd take the ticket and then he'd just open his glove compartment in the car and he'd put it in there. And I mean, this is serious. He did this for a couple of years and he had a stack of tickets. You know, he figured, nobody's calling me. I haven't been arrested. You know, it's just paperwork. You know, they'll forget about it. Well, you know, they don't forget about it. And so one day, you know, he's driving along. Maybe I think he was speeding or done something and the policeman stopped him. And uh, when he checked, he realized that he had all of these outstanding tickets, you know, thousands and thousands of dollars you know, of accrued interest and penalties and so on. So, so they seized his car and he went to court. And uh, the thing about uh, Angelo is most of his salary you know, went to pay for his car. He didn't, have a lot of, he didn't have a lot of extra, lived with his parents. And so in the end at court, he had to give up the car. They, they, took, they impounded the car, they kept the car in order to pay off all of his tickets all of his fines. And he is the perfect example of the ostrich method. I have a financial problem, I just ignore it. It's like it doesn't exist. Well, we know that ignored problems simply grow worse with time. Another bad solution is uh, the chicken solution. The chicken solution is what I call escape therapy. You know, we have money problems and all kinds of problems like that. Let's just take a vacation. 
Or let's go out shopping, you know, buy something new, feel good about going. Don't you feel good when you go shopping? Let's do that. Let's just go shopping. We'll feel great. I call that the chicken solution. Refusing to face the truth. Uh, uh, you know, substituting a, a pleasant, running away from the problem. You know what I'm saying? And, and, and it'll make me feel better. Now, this is only a temporary solution at best. You only feel good for a little while, while you're shopping. It usually creates more debt and it's fatalistic. You know, well, you know, in the end, we're all going you know, to die or we may go bankrupt or they may come and get it. And well, So what? Let's, let's, let's spend some more money and feel good while we're able. The other solution, bad solution, I call the parakeet solution. You know parakeets, they repeat over and over again the same thing. Well, the parakeet solution is when we repeat the same mistake. You know, do you have a lot of debts? Well, here's the parakeet solution. Just you know, consolidate everything into one big, huge debt. And then you know, you'll be solved. You'll just have one little payment. But we don't realize that in doing that, we've just repeated the problem, we're, we're, not, we're not addressing the debt. All we're doing is giving ourselves a chance to keep spending. Because usually what happens when people consolidate their debt, yeah, they now have one payment against all those, those old, old debts, but they haven't changed anything in their lifestyle and they usually continue to make other indebtedness. And so now what they end up with is they have one large debt and they're creating new and smaller debts in addition to the big one. Why? Why do I call it the parakeet? They're simply repeating the same mistake over and over again. Then we have the horse solution. Do you have a lot of debt? Man, just work like a horse to get rid of it. Get a second job, do overtime, you know, let your wife get a job too, put the kids into daycare, maybe she can get a, you know, a job on the weekend on top of her regular job, more hours at work away from the house. Does that really solve the problem? Because more hours away from one another, more hours away from the home and so on and so forth simply creates more pressure on the couple who is already under pressure because of financial indebtedness. And then there's the spider solution, like the black widow spider you know, that eats its mate. Well, the spider solution is, hey, how about just eliminating the seeming cause of my problem? And that is you. <laughs> you, know, you spend too much, so here's how we're going to do this. I'm going to get rid of you. Now we know that this really doesn't eliminate the problem. It merely creates more problems and more indebtedness. I have, I have news for you. There's no such thing as a budget divorce. You see these signs sometimes, you know, it said uncontested divorce, you know, $240 or $180, you know, budget divorce, cheap divorce. No such thing as a cheap or budget divorce. Maybe you might pay less as far as money is concerned to process paperwork, but I guarantee you that there is always, always an incredibly high emotional and spiritual cost uh, to a divorce. So most people who are continually in financial trouble are so because they refuse to base their lifestyle on their salaries and then they're in the trap. And when they get into the trap, they go deeper into the trap by using some of these poor financial solutions to get out of trouble that I've just shown you. Well, you know, we can't just show bad solutions. Let's, let's, try to show, uh, let's try to show some good solutions because there are good problem solving methods for financial difficulties. For example, first of all, establish your style of living based on your current earning power and not your future earning power. You know, if you're going to get the raise in six months from now, you know, in the promotion they've promised you, don't start spending that money until you actually have the raise. Continue to live on the money that you make now, not the money you wish you had, that you think you're going to have, that they've promised that you will get. Don't, don't, don't do that. In this way, you will have a better chance to be free from debt 
and the financial pressure that comes from debt. In Proverbs chapter 22, verse seven, the, uh, the, uh, Solomon writes, just as the rich rule the poor, so the borrower is servant to the lender. Proverbs 22, verse seven. You know, there's a whole lesson that we could make just on this scripture. If we could learn just this one thing, we would be free. So would our country be free. That's one of the reasons why many in our country are saying we have to be careful, we're having way too much debt in our country and other people you know, own our debt. The borrower is always the slave to the lender. Now this idea, you know, establish your style of living based on your current earning power, it sounds good and I don't think anyone here would disagree with that, but it's not easy to do. This practice requires certain things. First of all, it requires honesty with yourself. You have to be honest, you have to be realistic about what you can afford. I mean, again, no one disagrees with that, but it's so hard to actually put it into practice. To be honest about your financial capability. Can I or can I not afford this car, this house, this activity, and so on and so forth. And then, of course, self-control. Saying no to yourself. Saying no to your impulses. Very, very, very difficult. But these things, honesty and self-control, are necessary if you're going to practice financial uh, moderation. Um, another thing that is uh, necessary um, is alertness. In other words, be aware of the trap. Advertisers, for example, know that women make or influence most of the money decisions in the home, and this is why ads are usually directed at them primarily. You need to know that. You know all the buttons that I talked to you about? You need to be aware that advertisers have only one thing in their minds. They want you to buy their stuff. And they're, they're not caring if it's something you need or you don't need, if it's something you can afford or you can't afford. That, that doesn't calculate in their, you know, in their calculations, in their plan. Their plan is to uh, uh, get as many people as possible to buy their product. That's not evil, I mean, that's just business, right? So you have to be the one to know yourself, to know when uh, you're purchasing out of pride or you're purchasing out of impulse and so on and so forth, rather th than purchasing on a real need based on affordability. And I might say, you know, I said women, advertisings are, you know, a lot of them are, are focused on women, but men also are, are targeted for advertising in a certain way because advertisers know that men are greater impulse buyer than women. You know, women, they like to shop, they like to look, they want to look. Even if a woman goes into a store, she wants to look at something, you know, even if she finds it right away, the thing she's looking for, she's still going to browse around and look at things before she finally settles. Men are not like that, right? We know that. I mean, men, you know, there's a reason why they put the men's department right away when you walk into a, into a store, you know, a big department store. And the reason for that is that men will not ask for directions and climb six flights of stairs to find the men's department. If they don't find it right away, they're done. They look at stuff, they like it, they want to buy it. It's impulse buying. And, and marketers know this. Another thing too is that men usually buy more expensive things. You know, they, buy, they buy less you know, quantity of things, but they're the ones that buy the really expensive things, the, the boat. You know, the, the, uh, the, the, the new car, the, uh, the, uh, you know, uh, the Sidhu or whatever, whatever it is, you know, they buy the big, to uh, the big toys. And a lot of times men are motivated to purchase through pride. You know, the marketers appeal to their pride. You know, oh, my hero. You know, sometimes I hear people when they, they come in with a brand new car, oh, they, they, they're congratulating. Congratulate it. Congratulations on your new car. You know, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. You know, yeah. Yeah. Bought a brand new Buick. You know, yeah, well, congratulations. You know. 
congratulations, you, know, you just spent 40,000 bucks, you're in debt for the next seven years for this vehicle. I, I don't get the congratulations part. But marketers understand that. And then another thing that is required if you're going to put this idea of living and, and, and buying based on your earning power, you know, honesty, self-control, be alert, know what's going on, and then learn to be content. You know, we should learn to be satisfied with what we have, knowing that God is the one who provided it, whatever that is. I want to read a passage out of 1 Timothy chapter 6. 1 Timothy chapter 6, Paul talks about this idea. And you know, he writes this 2,000 years ago, and yet it is so apropos for our time today. He says, but godliness actually is a means of great gain when accompanied by contentment. For we have brought nothing into the world, so we cannot take anything out of it either. If we have food and covering with these, we shall be content. But those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a snare and many foolish and harmful desires which plunge men into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all sorts of evil and some by longing for it have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many, many griefs. And so Paul says we should learn to be satisfied with what we have based on the idea that this is what God has given us. If we have enough to provide an honorable life, he says, food and clothing and, and housing, if we can live in an honorable way, then we should have enough. And wanting more than this can be, can be risky at times. You know, the art of being content with what we have at the moment is actually the gateway to freedom and peace of mind and true enjoyment of life. Because contentment eliminates greed and pride, all those inner pressures, all those inner fleshly pressures are there because for one reason or another, we're not content with what we have. Now, some people think that you know, contentment means settling. I'll just settle for what I've got, that's it. Who, who wants to try? Uh, I'm not going to try anymore. That, that's, that's settling, you know, that, that, based on laziness, I think. Contentment is God has given me what I have today and I will give thanks for it. It doesn't mean that I cannot strive to improve my lot, to make things better. It doesn't mean that. But it means, but right here and right now and right today, I will, I will learn to be content with what I have been given and what I have, even if I realize there may be margin for improvement. And the way to contentment is through the practice of thanksgiving. If you just list you know, the things that you actually have and give thanks for those things, God enables you to have contentment for what you have. You know, Paul says in Romans uh, first chapter that the first sin, the first level of sin is that men refuse to give thanks. And then from there, they just, you know, a downward spiral. But the, the opposite is true also. The way to move upward spiritually is to begin by giving thanks for what we have today. Not praying for stuff that we might get in the future, but rather have a prayer that gives thanks for the actual things that we have today. And so for men to, the, the, the trick of course for, for men, you know, uh, males, is to be realistic about what we truly can afford to buy. And for women, the true challenge of submission is to respect and live within their husband's or primary earner's earning power. That's how we arrive at contentment. Now, another good problem solving technique for financial stress, aside from li living within your earning power, right? We say we're going to live within our earning power and that requires us certain, certain things that we have to do. Uh, another thing that we can do that helps us to live within our earning power is to um, create a budget, you know, make financial priorities. In other words, establish priorities for the way that you're going to spend the money that you do have. For example, 
here are some of the priorities that we should have financially. One of them is we ought to give the first portion of whatever we make to God. Again, I want to read a proverb here. Proverb uh, chapter 3, verse 9 and 10. Solomon says, honor the Lord from your wealth and from the first of all your produce. So your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will overflow with new wine. So here you have an instruction and a promise. The instruction if, is give to God the first portion of all that you have, whatever it is, no matter how small or large, give him the first portion. Notice he, he doesn't say give him half or give him 10% or give him 70%. He doesn't say that. He says give him the first portion, give him the first slice off the top before you give to anything else. Taxes, rent, saving, the first portion goes to the Lord. He says, do that. And then there's a promise. The promise is, if you do that, then God will, will bless you in a financial way. You see, when you give the first portion to God, He blesses the entire amount. And the entire amount becomes holy as if you gave Him the entire amount as if you gave him the entire amount. See what I'm saying? I mean, God deserves to receive everything that we have. Really, He does. He is worthy that whatever I make, whatever I have, I should offer it to Him, all of it, because He's worthy of that. But God understands that I need stuff. I need to eat and live and so on and so on. I need to drive a car. And so He says, well, here's what we'll do. You give me the first portion and I will bless the entire amount, as if you had given me the entire amount. And not only that, I will give you the ability to use what's left in the best of ways. Okay. So when you give the first portion, He gives you the wisdom to manage the rest. When you do this, what happens is that you express your trust in Him to provide. I mean, you know, credit limits, you know, credit limits are not financial protection. God is your financial protection. He's the one that protects you. Our security is not that we have a, like a government job or a government pen. A lot of people say, oh, I got a government job and I got a government pension. You know, I'm set for life. That's my security. No, no, our security is Jesus Christ, the Lord. That's our security that I have a secure job with the government and a secure pension, that's called a blessing from God. That's not called security. Another thing that we need to, uh, to do, um, uh, as far as you know, making financial pr priorities, giving the first portion to God, uh, is to establish a reasonable budget. If you establish a reasonable budget, then you will be able to manage the rest of your income in a wise way, not forgetting to provide for your family. I have here just a, a very simple um, a budget guideline worked out by a Christian economist. Some people are shocked, you know, but I've seen it work in many homes when it has been, uh, where it has been tried. And basically this budget here says, you know, you put your gross income, and I think everybody's got a copy of this worksheet. Those people who are watching this on DVD, this worksheet and all other worksheets are available online. You just download them if you need to. So this guideline budget, you put your gross income, you know, the total income from everything you get. You, you're still working, but you're collecting part of a pension. You know, all of that, that's all in the pile. Okay? Then what you do is you take God's part first, percentage of that gross, whatever that is, you know, the Bible in the Old Testament said 10%, but you decide. It's a portion that you give. 10% was a guideline. You know why 10%? Because when we give 10% off the top to God, it requires sacrifice. That's why. 10%, at the 10%, giving at the 10% level is the beginning of sacrifice. That, I mean, it gets harder and harder if you go to 12, 15, 20%. But at 10% is the threshold for sacrifice. It costs you really something to be able to give God 10% of your gross. Then of course, taxes and all those type of things have to be taken out. And then the net spending 
income is based on a percentage. In other words, you shouldn't spend more than a certain amount of percentage on certain items. So housing and all that goes with that should not be more than 30%, 32% of your net income. Food, 15%, auto, 15 insurance, debts, and so on and so forth. It's not based on a number, it's based on a percentage. So the more money you make, for example, then you know, the more actual money you have to spend on each different uh, category. All right. So if you are living according to your means, in other words, you're living based on your earnings, then this is a wise way to divide that money uh, to enable you to have some sort of financial uh, balance. All right, so let's, let's have a bit of a summary here, if you wish, for this uh, lesson. Listen, we're, we're, you know, we're devoting one lesson to this topic, and you know, there are many seminars where you have an entire weekend when you're talking just about money, but I think we've kind of touched some of the high points here, some of the important points. Hopefully this has been uh, uh, helpful to you. So let's summarize. First of all, if you spend more than you earn, you are in debt, and debts cause pressure especially in a, in a marriage relationship. Secondly, there are positive and negative ways of dealing with this kind of financial pressure. And we've talked about the negative ways. You, know, you can ignore it, you can try to escape it, you can try to increase your workload, you can divorce your partner and do all kinds of things, but those solutions simply create more problems and more pressure. And then, of course, there are some more positive solutions. You can exercise honesty, you know, realize this is how much I make, this is where I'm at, this is how much I can spend. You can exercise self-control, you know, don't, let, don't let those buttons you know, get pushed, don't respond in that way. You can uh, cultivate contentment through thanksgiving and the recognition of what God has given you. And of course, doing these things will mean that hopefully you'll be able to live within your means. Again, today, I live within my means today. Uh, if I want to, if I am able, I'm always working to improve my means if I wish. Thankfully, the wonderful thing about this country is that we're allowed, we can do that. We can make the effort to improve our situation. All right. Um, and so uh, this contentment, as I was saying, uh, in living within your means, and this can be done, all of us can do this, and all of us can start doing this, regardless of where we're at in our life cycle. You can begin this by, of course, giving God the first portion in everything. Remember, a lot of times we're holding back from God, and He knows it. Even if no one else knows it, he knows what we're holding back from him. There's great relief, there's great praise, and there's great uh, uh, satisfaction in knowing that we're giving God a portion of everything that we have. There's a, a marvelous sense of freedom and trust that comes when we reach that level. So we give God the first portion of everything, and then we trust him to help us manage the rest. You know, good management begins with a reasonable, a reasonable budget. And of course, I give you the budget, you know, those figures, they're helping us get some approximations, all right? Giving us guidelines on how we can do this. So I encourage us, all of us, singles, widows, married couples, you know, everyone, I encourage us not to get caught in the money trap and allow a Satan a foothold in our emotional lives, in our financial lives, and of course in our married lives through the misuse of money. Well, that's our lesson for today. I appreciate everyone following along and we'll be back next time with lesson number seven in our series, In Love for Life, Building or Rebuilding a Great Marriage. Thank you very much.